Well, good morning, Southern Oregon, and welcome to the Real Estate Show, Southern Oregon's one and only weekly housing update for our local real estate market. I'm Alice Lima here with my co-host, Pete Belcastro, and we're both brokers at John L. Scott here in Southern Oregon. Good morning, Pete. Hey, uh, good, mo- good morning, Alice. <laughs> we're, look at this. We're, we're here with mid-July right now. Uh, smoke is, we, we got smoke again, we got fires, we got no water. And somehow, some way, people are still searching for homes and buying and selling property. Uh, our market continues to, I don't want to say defy logic in many ways, but it continues to be really strong. The demand is pretty high. Listings are up in some categories, you know, things like that. So uh, it's been, it's, we've been, we've been like this for almost a year, you know, from the pandemic, this kind of demand. Uh, listings are coming back, but still slowly climbing in some communities. So here in midsummer, we're, we're poised, depending on the weather, I think, Alice, what's going to be in a July and August before school starts again. I think the weather and smoke is going to play a big part in what real estate is going to do here in the next few weeks. Mm-hmm. It's going to be an interesting because it's an unusual uh, market cycle because we were disrupted last year. Um, yeah. But one of the sources of homes for sale continuously through the shutdown were estates. And uh, when there is a, a person who passes away or needs to go to another location to be taken care of, a lot of times there's issues that the family or the person themselves was not prepared for. So today we're lucky to have Milan Hansen of Southern Oregon Law a state attorney and a real estate attorney who's going to be chatting with us about some of those idiosyncrasies and uh, pitfalls of uh, estates and probate and real estate. So we're very... They can leave everything up to their family or somebody who don't even care about that. I think that's really a wrong wrong approach to take this. Yeah. It's important to do it the right way by getting a will or some sort of, of a trust for yourself, which really makes so much sense especially with so many complicated rules and laws uh if you have heirs is one thing alice if you don't have heirs it's another thing but we're gonna hear it about- matters if you're married or not in the state yeah. of oregon uh-huh. so be and aware of that own single anything people. <laughs> yeah. what you own. so I'm sorry can you say I, that I heard- again your audio went out there's also how much you own with property yes do you own anything and so uh, we'll hear what uh, 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 Milan has to say about that. It's a big topic and people shouldn't poo poo it because uh, it matters so much to your children or to your spouse that you do this the right way. Get in the yep. state. Get- and it doesn't make you die sooner. You're talking about it doesn't. No. <laughs> so anyway, we got a break. Uh, Pete Bill Castro, Alice Lima. We'll be right back with Milan Hansen, the state attorney. Do not touch that dial. Well, welcome back to the Real Estate Show, folks. I'm Alice Lima here with my co-host, Pete Bill Castro. We're both brokers at John L. Scott here in Southern Oregon. And we're so excited today to have a state attorney, Milan Hansen, with us. Welcome, Milan. Hello. So estate and real estate and planning and life events is a topic very near and dear to my heart. Um, Real estate can sometimes uh, be complicated if you don't document your situation properly with your estate. Isn't that right? That is, that is very correct. And you know, it's probably a bigger, it's probably a bigger problem than most people realize. Because so often you sometimes don't see the result of what's going to happen. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, it's, I get sometimes mixed, mixed feelings from people because even starting to make a plan sometimes triggers just a lot of these innate fears. And that a lot of people sometimes think that planning for what's going to happen when they pass away is somehow going to acknowledge it, you know, acknowledge their own mortality. And I have absolutely had some men come up to me and like, nope, not going to do it. And, you know, they could have been, you know, in their 60s and had three motorcycles. But uh, uh, <laughs> they, don't wanna, they don't want to talk about, they don't want to talk about you know, what's going to happen to them um, if something did, did, did realistically. Um, a lot of people kind of just really like, you know, you know, risky activities 
or a lot of macho people just say, you know what, I'm going to live forever. And you know what, God be damned, I'm going to live my life. Whatever happens to me on the back end or to my stuff, uh, whatever, I won't be around. Right. I've seen, uh, Milan, thank you for joining us. I, I, we, both Alice and I have clients who, who that same, react that same way when you say to them about an estate. I'm curious as to what you tell people about, because I got clients who say, you know, I ask them, do you have an estate plan? Do you have anything you know, like this? And whether they say no or whatever, but what, and they say, I don't have enough money. Or, I don't have a big enough estate to worry about that kind of thing or what. So tell, tell us just about when someone would use the service of getting an estate because some people say don't need them and some people do. I don't know what you even tell them. So what do you say to that? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of myths. And, you know, some of these myths are just what people kind of talk about amongst themselves. Sometimes there's even like very professional, big celebrity financial gurus that say, hey, you know what, you know, this will we'll tell you how to do this. Go to LegalZoom, go to this. And, you know, some of all this advice, I mean, it kind of comes from different areas, but a lot of, a, a person can really get confused really quick or oversimplify it. And just because maybe they don't, maybe if it's not the death that they're really scared about, they're really just scared of kind of complexity and sometimes thinking about really, hey, what would happen? Um, but it's a common, common myth that says, well, I don't have enough. I don't need one. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'll take it on a case by case basis. I mean, I had a client come in and say, "Well, isn't it true that if I, you know, if I have over three hundred thousand dollars, that I should have a trust?" And I said, "Well, I don't like to put a quite a number on it. I want you to think about what would you like to happen to your stuff. Or even then, sometimes we're not just planning for what's going to happen to your stuff when you pass away. But I really want you to think about." What's going to happen to you? And that's while you're living. And mo most people just completely don't even, don't even know the right questions to ask, haven't even thought about that far because they aren't really considering that there's about an 80% chance that most of us will spend at least two years of our life in some kind of assisted care facility. Two years. Two years. <laughs> and those assisted facilities can cost 5000 to 10000 a month here in the Rogue Valley. Right. And so, much, so many people think it's all about death, death, death. And it's like, no, no, no. Well, what about everything that happens in between? And especially if you're alone, if you're unmarried, or if you don't have like a really, really great support group here, like with kids that are really going to step up to the task, you aging alone almost puts you at more risk than other people. So putting some kind of plan in place is probably more important, even if, you know, what happens to your stuff when you've passed away is, you know, we're, you're not even worried about it. I'm really more concerned of what's going to happen to you during your lifetime and how are you going to be treated and who's going to step up because we had an attorney here in our office that did almost nothing but adult guardianships and conservatorships. Oh, wow. And what that is, is when you, and God bless, God bless, God bless America. I love, I mean, I love it. <laughs> land of the free, land of the brave. Um, and sometimes I've seen some of these older people that come from this generation of, you know, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And they, you know, they do, they just, you know, I'm going to do it on my own until the day they end up in a hospital and the doctors are saying, we can't release you. You're not going to, you know, we, you know, you're physically going to be okay, but now we don't know if you're going to be able to take care of yourself mm -hmm. when you get out. And I've had so many clients be absolutely like, Mr. Milan Hansen, you're going to, we're, I'm going to, I'm going to pass away in my sleep and <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go quick. And I've said, okay, you know what? That's a, that's a great goal. <laughs> Okay, that's a good, but <laughs> let's let's step back here and kind of think about it because if you get into that situation, it's going to be it's going to be very scary because a guardianship and conservatorship hearing is basically 
Sometimes it's initiated by the state. I mean, the, the doctors have some attorneys on call say, oh, we can't release this person. But the guardianship and conservatorship is kind of suing you to take away your right to make decisions for yourself. So if you haven't made if you haven't made a plan for yourself already, and I mean, a very easy way of doing it, and I still don't like durable powers of attorney. I have a whole big deal about that, but that's a whole other spiel. Um, at least putting in plans in place, who would be my durable power of attorney to take care of my finances if I couldn't do it? So is that uh, what a durable power attorney is, is specifically for finances? It, most, all, most all of them are just for finances. So this would be a person that could get access to your bank account, write your checks, pay your bills. Um, I don't like the durable powers of attorney as much. It's kind of a quick fix. It's kind of quick and dirty. A lot of the banking institutions aren't liking them because there is a lot of elder abuse. Um, some people that get that power, we really haven't told the kids like, hey, you know, this isn't your money. You know, you are here to, you know, take care of your parents or take care of the elder person. And there's not a lot of oversight. There's not a lot. Sometimes you're just kind of handing away the kings to the kingdom. But the alternative is if you do not kind of have this transition of power, transition to somebody to maybe start to take care of you when you've really kind of groomed this person, you've told them, hey, I would like you to, you know, to step up if I, if I need it. Um, you're going to end up in this, if you don't do it voluntarily, if you don't immediately say, Hey, I will, you know, I'm going to talk to my friends or my family, figure out who's, who might be around and available to help me. Should I ever need it? That it's going to happen involuntarily through the court system. And it's going to, in other happen. words, in other words, going to do it for you. If you don't plan ahead and have it down written for yourself, correct? Yeah. Yep. If you don't have a plan, the state has a plan for you, and you Someone, may not like that plan. I would suspect that, as you talked about, as families have changed over the over the years, that you're that we're going to see more and more of that. I mean, I see more and more clients of just you know one child, maybe many people without children. We're seeing smaller family units, so I would suspect that it's going to become more important as that as we age again with single people or couples without children. Uh, we're going to see more of that. And so having to plan, you're absolutely is correct, or someone's going to do it for you. And you're not going to, you may not, may or may not even like it, but gee, be smart and get a plan together. If you talk about a plan, are these complicated things? I mean, I just went through this myself. Uh, my, my mother had, you know, a, a, a loving trust. There's all sorts of different names for them. Do they all do the same thing though in the end? You, you know, a lot of people are going and when they come in and they say, I want a simple will, or I want a simple this. I try not to let a person kind of make that decision until they get educated on what are the options available to them. Because, and if they really want something simple, I say, hey, you know what, go to LegalZoom. I mean, if that's really what you want, because that's going to be, it's just going to be a form. I mean, a lot of people think it's like, I just need that piece of paper. And you're going to get it. And once you have it, then you're going to put it on your bookshelf and kind of forget about it. And you're like, oh, cross that off. I, you know, I did, I did this responsible thing. The problem is I see is every family is different. It is every family is different. Every person is different. I do not want to put them in so much of a box and so much of what some of that planning is, is kind of a cookie cutter one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get a person to kind of fit in these parameters. It's like, hey, you just did it. Here you go. Um, but we aren't really taking a look at what they own. I always ask title questions. How much property do you have? I mean, how many bank accounts do you have? And sometimes it doesn't matter how much you have. I mean, because very easily, I think that one person said, oh, I, wish I should have a trust after 300,000. I said, well, I mean, I mean, maybe it's, the trust will be easier to administer than sometimes having to go through probate. So we all these wills, a lot of, a lot of people have a will and they still don't understand that the will does not avoid probate. This kind of court process where you're going to have to divide a person's stuff. I, I mean, I call probate suing yourself 
for the benefit of your creditors. <laughs> <laughs> That's accurate though, isn't it? I don't think people realize there is a, a probate af- if there's a will. Um, but with all these trusts, I mean, you're talking about these loving trusts. I mean, they can all be the same thing. I mean, I call them revocable. I mean, it means you have the, most of the power during your lifetime. That trust is you. But there are sometimes a lot of fancy things that we can make that do, or even for tax planning. Um, and here in the state of Oregon, there's probably a little bit more tax planning that we can do if, depending on where your assets are at, which state they are. I mean, here in Oregon, we have a million dollar death tax exemption. We're one of the few states that has its own death tax or a state tax, some people call it. And it's probably one of the most restrictive in the nation and it kicks in at over a million. So you get it. it Yeah, go ahead. Got a break coming up. So hold those thoughts there because that's what people really are confused about. Probates and the kind of things you're talking about there. We need to delve into that more in the next segment because people don't know what to expect. As you're right, we put this topic off all of our lives until you know we're desperate. So it really has very good information, and we'll look we'll, we'll look forward to more of that here after this break. So uh, Pete Bill Castro, Alice Seema, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. We're speaking with Milan Hansen, the Southern Oregon Law Estate Attorney, Real Estate Attorney Extraordinaire. Do not touch that dial. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back, real estate fans. Alice Lima here, broker John L. Scott with my co-host, Pete Bill Castro. We're both brokers at John L. Scott here in Southern Oregon. And Milan Hansen is our guest today from Southern Oregon Law. And we're having a really interesting conversation about estates, guardianships, wills, probates, and that. And uh, Milan, right before the break, we were uh, talking about some of the finer points of taxes and what the state of Oregon has to offer. We want to finish your thought on that? Sure. Well, because the state of Oregon has this death or state tax that kicks in, I mean, you have an exemption of up to a million. It means if you have a million point two, you're only going to be paying the state taxes to the, to the state of Oregon on everything on you when you pass away on anything above that one million. Um, so when you have a married couple, you get kind of an exemption too. There's a little bit more we can play with there. Um, and we can structure these trusts so they do some interesting things to preserve each person's exemption, even on the death of the first spouse. Um, but if you're aging alone, you only got your one exemption. You only got your one, one, one million dollars. Um, so, which a lot of people, I mean, they say they want simple wills, but they aren't even like thinking about what they own. And I always go through this process of saying, hey, you know what? You might not, a lot of people do not consider themselves wealthy, but I have gone through their asset spreadsheets when I do my planning with them and I say, and I add every, make them add everything up and say, what do you own? What's your house in there? And I'll say, I'll, there's a lot of times I add it up and I say, congratulations. And I say, well, what, what, what for? And I said, did you know that you're, you're technically a millionaire? <laughs> what? what do you mean, little old me? I, I was like a school teacher. What are you talking about? I didn't know I had some money. And I said, well, I mean, look at you. I mean, you, your house here is, is worth a good, a good, good amount. It's got a good resale. It's been continuing to appreciate your retirement accounts have been doing really well. And, you know, you, you've got a little money in the bank. And a lot of times, a lot of good, hardworking folks don't realize that they've never, they've never stopped to think about it. I mean, they they've never stopped to add it up. Yeah. yeah. Because they'll go in and say, oh, I, you know, I have somebody do my taxes for me every year. And I'll say, yeah, but the tax person is always going to ask you what your income was, but they aren't taking a look at everything that you have. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had some people just their eyes kind of open just because they're like, what? I'm, I'm not. They didn't think they'd have anything to give, <laughs> give to their kids. And now that they, now all of a sudden that's starting a whole new thought process. Yeah, now it's a problem. So does that include um, stock accounts, retirement yes. accounts? What about um, are, their pensions? Is that added into it or does that go away when somebody dies? No, all, there's going to be so anything that is going to be passed. So depending on the type of the pension, because pensions are going to have all these weird rules. Mm-hmm. And these are going to be some pensions are transferable or you can, you know, you can, heirs can inherit typically spouses, but those are, 
pensions are going to be its own deal. And so that's going to be, well, wow. the t- typical lawyer answer is that depends. Um, <laughs> I've seen on a pension that sometimes the surviving spouse gets the right to the pension. So it gives them a comfortable life, but it will go away at the death of the, at the death of both spouses. So sometimes pensions are not inheritable and that's just mm. written in the contract. So uh-huh. one of one of the things you mentioned was if people are married. So for unmarried people, because this is what brought me into the world of estate planning very early on in my life, because I was so worried when I moved to the state of Oregon about how different it was from the other states I'd lived in. So can you give a little thumbnail about what unmarried single people uh, can expect if they die? <laughs> well, if you don't have a plan, as I've said, the state of Oregon has a plan for you. And so even if you have a will, if you have a will, you have a little bit more power over that process. You've kind of picked who's going to be there to, um, who's going to be there to kind of be the key person to get everything in order, pay off your debts, and then deliver what's left the inheritance to whoever you want to inherit from you. And you'll get an opportunity to kind of say, well, these are the people that I want to inherit. And you can specifically say, well, I want to disinherit some people that may have, may have, are probably in line to get something from you. If you don't even have a will in place, and a will will still go through probate. If you don't have a will, we're going to go through probate still, but you just don't have that option anymore because you didn't write it down in the proper way while you were living to what you wanted. You're still going to end up in probate, but now we're going to go by what's in, called intestate laws. And the intestate laws, this is your plan for if you don't have one, it would typically go everything to my spouse. And then sometimes even with blended families, if you have a spouse, it would go half to your spouse, half to your kids from another relationship. And I call that the trophy wife or cabana boy effect. It's kind of like right there. <laughs> you know, if you don't, sometimes the kids will be like, oh, you know, you know, we don't want our stepmom to, to get everything. And so the law, you know, knows that the stepmom or stepdad might inherit everything, take it from those kids, and then they're not going to inherit from that their step parent when they pass away because they're not the biological kids. So with mixed families, I always say it's a little bit more important to do planning. But mm-hmm. then if you really have no spouse, and then it's probably going to go everything to your kids in equal parts, regardless of whether you want it. I mean, the default rule is everything to the kids in equal. What if your kids are minors, so minor if, children under 18? Then this is, this is another big issue because minors of children cannot, minor children until they're 18, they cannot open their own bank accounts. So if there was another parent for those kids, maybe another unmarried a girlfriend or a boyfriend back in the day, um, they have your kids, they are going to have to go through what's called, they're going to have to go through the custody. I mean, not the conservatorship. So we talked about adult conservatorship, which is trying to, you're going to have to make decisions for an elder person who cannot make decisions for themselves anymore. Same thing happens with minor kids. So they're going to be too young to receive that money. I mean, maybe, I mean, if there's just, even if a person has one house, I mean, let's just imagine there that there's going to, and there's one kid, there's still a hundred thousand or something. Right. I mean, easily a hundred thousand to give to that kid. And so the conservator would have to go through or the guardian, whoever the parent of the kid is, or maybe there's another guardian out there, somebody that's going to step up an aunt or an uncle, they're going to have to go through this court process. It's going to cost extra money for them to go through it, to then be able to get the money for the kid, and they have to hold it. That conservator is, usually it ends up in a restricted bank account. And the conservator can kind of pull some of the money out to say, well, I'm spending it on the kid. I mean, maybe they have to go every time they want to, like, get the kid braces or something. They're like, oh, well, that's going to be $5,000, and I don't want to pay for that, but the kid's got 100000 over here. Maybe I can dip into that. They're going to have to go through Per, get court permission almost every time they want to take that money out to get it. Wow. And so that's going to increase a lot of the legal fees. Just yes, Milan, the, the word, the word probate just scares a lot of people. I mean, when you just say, 
you're going to have to go to probate and, and people freak out and get very nervous about that. Can you explain what, what causes that or how you avoid probate uh, for a lot of us? Because I know people don't want to do it if you don't have to, because it's money, it's costly, et cetera. So what are the triggers or how can I avoid that? Or what do I need to do to not have to go through probate? Well, in that instance, for if you did have minor kids, you'd have to go through probate. And then because they were minor kids, you'd still have to have a conservatorship. Somebody appointed as a conservator to receive that money. Uh -huh. um, because there's going to be, and then finally when the kid turns 18, they can have to release the money over them to immediately. And they're going to get suddenly a windfall of money. And I uh -huh. always kind of a little hesitant about children receiving money outright, especially if all of a sudden it's, it's a large amount of money because there's this lottery effect that if you get $200,000, $300,000 very early on, most likely that money isn't going to be there in five years' time. I mean, those kids are probably, I mean, they might spend the money to impress their friends or uh, they're going to get married right away with another interested partner who's going to say, oh, I know how to help you spend that money. <laughs> or they're going to buy Cor Corvettes. <laughs> but I mean, probate is this process of going through the court system. And if you don't have a will, you, if they have to, the, the, the person that's going to be in charge of the probate is going to be appointed by the court. They're going to be called a, a personal representative. In some states, we call it an executor. But I like, I mean, here we, in Oregon, we usually use personal representative and we call it, call it a PR. That person's going to have to round up all the assets, maybe get the house, sell off the house. If they have stock, they can sell the stock. Sometimes they'll just say, well, we want to hold it here and just give it to the kid as stock without, you know, getting all these uh, transfer fees. Um, but probate, one person's going to be appointed to get these assets, get them ready for the kid and go through this process there's a we have to take out a publication in the newspaper to say hey this person's passed away if they owe you money this is your last chance to get it so we have to have there's a four-month window for creditors to come forward and to make themselves known so anybody you owe, if you pass away anybody that's been waiting to get paid this is their time to get paid and you have to pay i'm always telling people nope you have to pay all these people that comes off because your inheritance, the legal word for inheritance is called residue. And that means oh. once you get, once you pay everybody off, you pay off, you pay off the creditors, you pay off the, the, the PR can take a PR fee. And usually that's between a thousand dollars. That's the personal, dollars representative, can the gets, personal representative can get paid. People don't realize that. Cause they're kind of working as the, a glorified accountant and they're yeah. making sure everybody's getting paid. So it is, it is job. It is a job. And I tell people they can take that PR fee if it's a family situation. Usually they say, no, I don't need to take more than my brothers and sisters. And I don't need to do it. A lot of people waive it, but it's there. And then we're going to pay, if there's estate taxes, we're going to pay any estate taxes. And then finally, lawyers, you're going to pay us lawyers. We're, in fact, we're almost first in line to get, get the money. And then whatever's left, after everybody's been paid, whatever's left, the residue the good stuff, then this is where finally, and this is why a probate can take six months, takes at least six months, I'd say, realistically. It, then that's if we're going quick. If it's simple and everything's lined up and good, often if we have to sell a house and we're trying to get a house ready, I mean, that can be three, four months just to get that going. And that causes delays. Realistically, I'd say probate takes a year. And whenever you file it, even if you have a will, that becomes public. And when we file it in the court, now it's, I mean, not only is it now public, but there's other big institutions out there, including the state of Oregon, which are looking at all these probate filings. And they're saying, oh yeah, hey, maybe that person, <laughs> they owe me money. I often see a claim from the state of Oregon for, I mean, if you have Medicaid fees, wow! Uh, the state of Oregon has been paying for your doctors. Occasionally, they the state of Oregon makes a claim, and I've seen them get up to a hundred thousand dollars or more. 
No, oh, did not know that. You know, we've got another break coming up, Milan. We are just going to have to have you back. There's so much more to talk about. We so appreciate your time, Milan Hansen, Southern Oregon Law. Uh, give him a call. He's an amazing estate attorney, amazing real estate attorney. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Bye. So Pete Belcastro, Alice Lima, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Well, welcome back to The Real Estate Show, folks. Pete Belcastro, Alice Lima. We're both brokers here in John L. Scott in Southern Oregon. We just had an amazing conversation with Milan Hansen, a state attorney here locally, Southern Oregon Law. Um, and Pete, you know, one of the things that Milan mentioned was uh, if part of your estate includes a house, you may not be prepared for how long the house might take to get ready and, and probate and, and all of that. And, you know, we have quite a few estate sales here in, in our area. Well, there's, there's a lot going on in that field. And uh, Milan is absolutely right. If you don't have a plan, the state is going to do it for you. So I, I, I my clients say, we always talk about that. Do you have it? You got to have something because otherwise someone's going to do that for you. So planning ahead of that. And you're right. You have, I'm, I'm involved with one where we have a personal representative going on. And uh, it has to be approved through an attorney. It slows the whole process down, but it eventually clears and eventually goes. And their the, the personal representative is in charge and, and signing the documents and trying to make sure the thing goes through. So it's out there all the time and uh, it's not going to go away. And I think that people really need to be prepared for those things, Alice. I mean, I've got, I've, I just did this myself in a trust. Uh, you know, my family has done pretty much all of that. We've all kind of gone through that because we had an experience years ago where we had to go through a probate and things like that because we weren't prepared. So it's really good advice there. Hey, the market this week, Alice, has just been really interesting, hasn't it? A uh, lot going on. I just wanted to give you one interesting stat that we talked about sales. You know, we talked about the luxury market and how big it is and how many is 25% of the market. This is an interesting stat though. $350,000 and less is, is, is a real popular price, as you know. It makes up just 10% of the listings in Jackson County right now, but it also makes up 50% of the sales last week. Wow. Isn't that, an, isn't that interesting? Yeah, so, yeah. They're yeah, coming so off and go off real fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but 10% of the listings and 50% of the sales come out of that $350,000 category. That is so interesting. You know, uh, luxury luxury sales, we've talked about those. Those seem to have plateaued. There's now 91 of them in Jackson Ooh. County. Seven from last week, even. So they've, that slowed down. Have we seen that plateau? Are we there? Uh, I, think, I think we're there. I, I just can't see things going up. Yeah, I definitely think we're leveling off. Um, um, as they flat. have any faster or any and there, and there are more listings still coming on this last week, 304 in Jackson County. It's still, you know, 60%. It's just still way down from where it was before. But there are coming back. They're going fast. The hottest market still remains in Josephine County, Alice. Price last week average, almost $500,000 again there on, on uh, let's see, on 15 sales. So sales have slowed down a little bit uh, across the counties. Pending sales are down a little bit from where they were a few weeks ago. So maybe we've hit that plateau there and things may be settling in. We're going to see. So it's super exciting to have so many of the lower priced properties. That's a game changer for the market. It also gives a lot of breathing room for people who are trying to sell their house and buy a more expensive one. That's what we've been waiting for. It's super exciting. Well, we're, but yeah, you're only talking about a very, very tiny fraction. I mean, uh, uh, for the for the demand that's there in the housing, it's still not even close uh, to what we need. And we're still seeing people leaving here, our communities, they're selling their places, they're leaving because they simply have no other place, no replacement property here. That's still probably the biggest issue with sellers who want to remain here uh, and those who leave. It's a big difference. If you're leaving town, that's easy. If you're not and you're trying to stay here, where do I go? And that's still been a big issue now for well over a year. Yeah. And it makes it a trickier negotiation when you're out writing offers because, um, you know, you're contingent on selling the house you have. And even if you're, you are in escrow, if another buyer comes along, you know, competing on the house that you want and they don't have a house to sell. 
All right. I throw this and you've got these fires that are around us again that are destroying homes and destroying properties. We've got no water and irrigation things. So there's lots of issues out there that people need to be aware of. Where am I going? Is it going to slow our market down? It has to. I mean, the, these types of conditions cannot just it cannot be around us so extreme and not have an effect on real estate. And I think we're beginning maybe to see that, especially if the fires and smoke continue, Alice, we're going to be in for another really long next few months. And I hope we, I hope that's not the case. Yeah, it's such a bummer to see all that smoke again. We were kind of hoping to skate through this year. <laughs> well, uh, that's, that's any more that's absolute that's fantasy thinking. Uh, it's the same way with water. It's just we're, we're hoping. That's the only thing we have to go by is hope. They can't even put that fire out, that huge fire that's now gone from Beatty, Oregon, here into Lake County, Alice, is 40 some miles that that fire has traveled. So, wow. you know, we're in real estate. Our, our communities are changing. Our beautiful forests are being destroyed. And, you know, um, this, the place we call home so beautiful that we always talk about is really under attack right now. And it's very sad to see happen. It really is. Yeah. And I worry yeah. a little about our farmers, you know, some, one of the ditches got shut off. I think TID got shut off this week. Um, and so now there's, well, and, and people knew that was going to happen, but it just yeah. means uh, the extraordinary circumstances we've had here in Southern Oregon going on two years, uh, you know, coming out of the big spike and then the Corona and that spiked again, and then the fires and, and now, now here we are without enough water. So it's just been very, very difficult, but people still want to move. Um, and a lot of them are estates. And that's why it was so good to have Milan Hansen here talking about that today. Yeah, it defies logic sometimes, but I mean, the biggest. Yes, it does. Totally. <laughs> Well, and you know, speaking of defying logic, um, I have somebody who is selling a tier two cannabis license. And what's interesting, if, if you don't know about those is you can buy those, they're a commercial grow license for cannabis, and you can apply it to a different property. And so we have somebody who's selling that for $350,000. And even in a drought, people want to buy it. So it's it's wow. yeah it's you know we don't have it sold sold but it it's just like you said such an interesting time now, everything everything will sell i i, I bought less um you know hemp growing this year because of water we're, we're pumping groundwater out to do irrigation around our in southern oregon right now how much is out there how much is still left that we're not using um you're right. But, you know, when you have farms and you have people that rely on that, we're seeing just a lot of uh, wells that were dug, production wells that were dug, you know, years ago and, and they're being used right now because uh, uh, it's a it's a big mess. You know, hey, the fair is on this weekend. Jackson County, other fairs are coming up. Uh, hope people get a chance to go out and enjoy those a little bit with that with the smoke. I know it's kind of hard, but these are big events in our community trying to get back to normal and hopefully people will take advantage of them and and go back and, and start that and enjoy that again. A lot of kids and 4-H and animals and been preparing for two years for this because everything was shut down last year. So Oh, and that was so sad. Wasn't that just so sad last year? So let's hope and hope and pray that that it goes well. Let's hope and pray also, Alice. I mean, we talk about hoping and praying uh, that we get some relief to this terrible weather and get some, you know, it's uh we're in trouble here. And I think we all gotta face that and Let's go and see what we can do and, and be strong and be smart about what, what we do in the future here. Well, thank you so much for listening to The Real Estate Show. It'll be repeated tomorrow at uh, 6 o'clock. Thank you to Rogue Valley Association of Realtors, Guy Gile Mutual of Omaha Mortgage, and John L. Scott, Southern Oregon. We appreciate our sponsorships immensely. Pete Castro, Alice Lima saying, have a beautiful weekend. Bye now.